Hello everyone and welcome to the Battle of the Rappahannock custom multiplayer game episode number 8. In part 7, we reviewed the turns between 4 o'clock and 5.40 p.m. We saw Sickles attacking and driving back McClaws' division on the Confederate left flank. We saw Sykes' division being pushed back by Rhodes' Confederate division in the center of the battlefield. And we saw Reynolds continue to hold out against the repeated attacks of Yule and Hill's corps. That brings us to the 6 p.m. staff meeting. This is the first open discussion the sides have had since 4 p.m. and the last they will have until 8 p.m. Lee took control of the meeting from the start. Things were not going well for his army but Lee remained confident in ultimate victory. I would in no way trade our position for theirs. We are still winning, but our lead has been cut. We must work to stretch our lead back again. Lee chose to look at the recent heavier losses as the cost of their offensive style of warfare. But these losses worked both ways, and the Federals were equally being worn down. You can't crack apart a solidly held defensive position without taking losses. Lee now laid out his plans to crush the Federals and win the battle. We are going to double down on our plan to smash Reynolds, Hancock, and Meade on the eastern side of the Rappahannock and attempt to battle there. McClaws would fall back towards Brandy Station and continue to act as a distraction to keep Sickles' force fighting in the west. I feel like I've heard that command before because it's probably the command they've given two, three, four times now. So far, it hasn't worked out well for them as McLaws just continues to be sucked into this battle with Sickles' force. Wilcox would cross to the east of the Rappahannock River and join in the battle against Reynolds and help finish them off in the morning. Ewell would continue to attack Reynolds until darkness, at which point he would begin to rest his corps. A.P. Hill would start to rest and reorganize his corps now so as to be ready and rested to finish off Reynolds in the morning. We now go to the 6 p.m. Union discussion. Hooker met with his generals and was in a positive state of mind as the battle was seemingly shifting in their favor. Hooker felt Lee's army was taking heavier losses than they could sustain in their attacks and that they might be forced to fall back from the fighting if such losses continued. The biggest problem for Hooker was in the increasingly desperate situation on Reynolds's front. While Reynolds was still holding, night could not come fast enough. Hooker believed that by falling back with Reynolds under the cover of dusk and darkness, that his Grand Division might be able to recover and form a new position somewhere to the north around Elkton. As for Meade's V Corps, Hooker vacillated about their usage still. He contemplated sending them back to the east to support Reynolds, south to attack Rhodes, and even back west to support Sickles. Reynolds, undoubtedly suffering from some exhaustion, was more pessimistic in his outlook than Hooker. It is a mystery to me why the rebels have not just moved most of their force around my left flank. This is what I would have done. At this point, I am not sure of what the Rebels' plans consist. My current plan is to stand fast and buy time for Sickles to damage their other flank. Our retreating to open ground, I fear, may result in a rout. Hooker believed Reynolds had the time and ability to disengage just as dusk fell and to fall back to the northeast. The dynamic now is to reduce your losses and minimize any routing before nightfall while Sickles continues to hammer away at McLaws. Reynolds urged Meade to completely abandon Tin Pot Ford and to turn his whole force eastward to support his forces then fighting against both Hill and Yule. Reynolds also believed it would be easier to break out to the northwest rather than to the northeast, as it would bring him closer to Meade's forces, which might act in support of his actions. Reynolds would send his cavalry and the supporting units in the east towards Elkton and then try to reunite his forces later in the battle. After some more discussion, Reynolds' plan was approved. Hooker's chief concern was to minimize the losses on Reynolds' front, and this plan seemed to most quickly extricate Reynolds' force 
from their present predicament. The 6 p.m. Union orders were then issued. Reynolds's plan to break out in two directions was approved by Hooker, and he would commence preparations to do so at once. Meade would stay east of the Rappahannock and move to support Reynolds's actions in any way possible. Sickles would continue his offensive against McLaws's division and seek to cause maximum losses on them in an effort to break the will of Lee's army to keep fighting on this battlefield. So here is my unasked for two cents about everything. First off, the rebel plan remains largely unchanged. They're going to attack Reynolds and fall back with McClaws, which is basically the same thing they've been doing, or trying to do, for the last four, six, eight hours it feels like. So far, they haven't yet broken Reynolds and McClaws has gotten himself in a lot of trouble. The one thing that the rebels did decide to change up is that Wilcox's division is moving to the east. But unfortunately, that's kind of an unrealistic idea. And why do I say that? To be honest, time and distance considerations, they just haven't been taken into account here. Both sides know that the other is likely approaching their limits and should be thinking more about maximizing short-term point gains and not worrying about any kind of long-term commitments in this battle. Therefore, sending Wilcox all the way to the east just doesn't seem to make sense to me. It is a long-term commitment, and Wilcox won't even arrive there until maybe late tomorrow morning, at which point the battle will likely be over. So sending him on this long march is just a waste of time and a poor usage of his forces. I'd argue Wilcox should move directly west and try to give McLaws a safe harbor to retreat to, probably around Brandy Station. The Union plan is interesting to say the least. Reynolds knows the enemy has infantry and cavalry to the northwest of his position. So how does this breakout northwest happen then? He's going to have to literally go over and through the Confederates blocking the road to the northwest. And with the other Confederates on his flank and rear, I don't understand how he's going to be able to make it out in that direction. Personally, I'd be heading northeast, especially since they already know that Hampton's division is falling back and away from that flank. For Meade's corps, do something. I feel like he's divided his forces into numerous parts, none of which poses any possible threat by itself. They're all going in different directions, and they just aren't doing anything. They need to condense their force, pick a direction to move, and move out already. Right now, Meade's forces are in, what, four or five different spots, all going in different directions, and none of them are any threat at all to the Confederates right now. Lastly, keep rolling with Sickles. If the Federals are going to win this battle, it's going to be because Sickles is able to knock out McLaws' division. So they must keep up the pressure with Sickles' force as long as they possibly can. They must destroy McLaws' division. In reality, neither side should be making any long-term plans at this point. As I said before, the end is rapidly coming as the two sides are suffering heavier losses as the battle progresses. All efforts should be aimed at rapid short-term point gains over long-term strategic thinking. At this point, anything that you have to plan should be planned for maximum impact. You should not be thinking, oh, well, we can move such and such, and in 15, 20, 25, 30 turns down the road, we're going to have a force here and be able to take advantage of this. There's simply not time for that. And that brings us to the end of the 6 p.m. turn. And Sickles has done a good job. He has continued to put the pressure on McLaws's division, which is unable to get out of these woods and back towards Brandy Station. Over in the east, there has been some cavalry action as the Federals have counterattacked against Hampton's forces, which are falling back. They also managed to isolate the 1st North Carolina Battalion and will likely capture them during the next turn. 6.20 p.m., and Kershaw is isolated. 
Sickles continues to put the pressure on. Let's go ahead and zoom in on that side of the battlefield. So here we have the forces of Sickles and McLaws fighting one another around the Beasley's Woods. And the Federals have been advancing in this general direction, trying to get around McLaws' flanks for the last few hours. While the Confederates have been trying to fall back, but pretty unsuccessfully up to this point, to get away from these woods and back towards Brandy Station. They simply aren't moving fast enough. And as a result, this force here has now become isolated. General Kershaw, along with these two isolated South Carolina regiments, will undoubtedly be captured during the next turn. Things continue to go badly for McLaws' division. Pressure in the West. Not only are things going poorly for McLaws' brigades in the Beasley's Woods falling back towards Brandy Station, but McLaws' other brigades are now being hit harder and harder along the turnpike towards Culpeper. And it's becoming more obvious that they might also lose some regiments isolated and captured if they are not careful as Sickles drives against their forces as well. Over on the other flank, it's kind of the opposite story. The fighting goes on. Except here, it's the Federals that are trying to hold and the Confederates which are trying to overrun them. And there is a rebel opportunity coming up as they put more pressure on the Federal lines. So let's zoom in on this area here. On the Federal left flank, you can see that they are scrambling to try to throw a force that can stop the Confederates from working around that flank. And although it looks like the Federals have enough troops, most of these forces here are now fatigued and tired. Reynolds' guys are going up against Johnson's division, which is trying to move around their flank. And they've been doing this probably for the last hour or two as they stretch the Federal line, trying to see where they can break them. These forces here, though, are the ones that concern me the most. Right now, there are 265 dismounted Federal cavalrymen along with six artillery pieces on a slight hill with some breastworks. But just across the way from them, there's 850 fresh Confederates of Davis's brigade, which, if they are smart, will just attack this direction and melee those forces and capture them. If they're able to get this high ground, they're going to be really hard to dislodge. And that means the Federals will be cut off from their escape route to the north. So this is a critical turn coming up as the Confederates have a really good opportunity to not just block the Federal way north, but to also capture some guns and bust a hole in the Federal line. Also, there's some distractions going on. There are these two units just to the south of the Confederate line which were bypassed during the initial Confederate attacks. They are now moving to try to get in behind the Confederate line, not really to accomplish much other than to make themselves known and possibly draw off some forces from the Confederates attacking Reynolds. All right, it is now time for a time out. Both sides are now at the 75% line for their total losses allowed in this battle. At the end of turn 41, the rebels were up by 13 percentage points over the Federals. They were at 64%, while the rebels were at just 52% at the end of turn 41. But now, at the end of turn 45, the exact calculations are as follows. The rebels are at 74.6% of the way to their lost limit. The Federals are 74.2% of the way to their loss limit. So you know what? Congratulations. The Federals stuck it out after a disastrous start to this battle and the loss of the entire Iron Brigade. It would have been really easy for them to just throw in the towel at that point and say, you know what? This battle is not going as planned. We're just going to go ahead and walk away from it. But they did not do that. They fought hard to make up the lost ground and are now, for the first time in this game, technically closer to victory than the Rebels are. But just wipe out that congratulations because this is still anyone's game at this point. Taking a quick look at the order of battles which have been updated here, 
you can go ahead and see that the Confederates have lost 12,867 men, with the heaviest losses occurring in Anderson's First Corps. Notable is that Anderson's Corps has lost 47 of their 64 guns so far. This is really hurting them as they don't have enough artillery to stop and threaten Sickles as they advance. For the Federals, they've taken 16,455 losses up until now, with the majority really coming from Reynolds' left Grand Division, which has been engaged really since the battle began. All that means, though, is that we are all tied up. Both sides have taken three-quarter losses, which means it is now the fourth quarter. Both sides are at 75% of the way to their loss limit. It is go time. This is a great battle between these two, and they have been punching it out really since the battle began. So this is going to be a really fun thing to watch as we come down to the wire. This can go anyway, and I really don't know what's going to happen. And I'm pretty darn excited just to see what goes on here. And because of that, I'm going to end this part. So this is going to be the end of part one of episode eight. And we're going to pick back up with the 6.40 p.m. turn in part two. That way, I've got more than enough time to dissect the turns as we watch and maybe see the end of this battle before night falls. So what am I looking forward to in the next part? Well, can either side even make it until nightfall? Will one side or the other throw a knockout punch, which will end the battle before then? And will Reynolds or McClaws even be able to make it to nightfall? Both are under a lot of pressure right now, and I think the battle hinges on which one breaks or doesn't break first. All right, everyone, thank you for watching. It's getting exciting. I'm having a lot of fun watching this as we progress, and I hope you're enjoying it. Be sure to check out part two, which is coming up soon. Thank you.